Good morning, everyone. Um, I know that it's hard to come back after an evening of festivities. I certainly have had a hard time coming back. Uh, but but we, we've got a great program here today as well, and uh, we intend to, to be on time, as we were yesterday as well. I'm sorry for those of you that missed the reception because you were at an equivalent address on the other side of town, which was a parking lot where people do cartwheels and stuff like that. It was very bad, obviously. But if you were in, the, in that area, you know that it was a half hour away from where the actual reception was being held, the beautiful World Step Pavilion, which was absolutely amazing. So thank you for those people that came for the reception. I'm so sorry for those people that missed it. And there were quite a few. I was quite amazed. Anyway, so I just wanted to go very quickly. We're not going to do a repeat like I thought we would do yesterday of, of, um, of yesterday's presentation. Today, what I will do, though, is just go through this disclaimer again. And this disclaimer basically says there's no implication or otherwise of securities being offered. And if that is the case, and in fact a company makes the claim that the security is being offered and you accept it, don't come and talk to me, okay? That's what it basically says. Uh, but in any case, we have to put this disclaimer up because this is in fact a public event and people are presenting, and people are, in fact, raising money. So I have to put that up there and make sure that you read it carefully. And those of you that haven't read it, come and see me later. I'll give you a copy of it, OK? Um, today's sessions, you know that we wanted to talk always and keep in mind the perspective of the farmer and the farm in general, as farming is evolving and changing with all of the challenges. And you heard some of them yesterday, the most important one being, obviously, the importance of innovation to the farmer is not something that we ourselves as a community have necessarily recognized because they're on the front lines of having to put up with the nonsense that people have dished out at them. They become the front line of the resistance to the science that is driving the innovation in our sector. So it's up to us to actually take, on the, the, uh, take, take up the, uh, the challenge to put this out to the public at large. So we've got the perspective of farming continuing today with three perspectives, a Midwestern commodity farmer, a, a Western high produce farmer. Um, it's actually an association that is extraordinary in the West. And then an, uh, a perspective from an indoor ag, uh, I would call him farmer. And I think that would be perfectly reasonable to call you farmer, right, Darren? I mean, perfectly reasonable. OK. And then we have the disruptive dialogue, the one panel today. Uh, on gene editing, uh, which of course continues out the, the scientific precepts we started talking about last year uh, on the GMO discussion. So the special content sessions, uh, we also have the spotlight sessions on the view of, of the innovator and the view of the investor, and I'll talk more about this as we come to those sessions. The spotlight, the special content sessions today, uh, there is a Kaufman Foundation Design Lab that will occur here in the, oh, I think in the other, in the other auditorium, um, which is in fact an opportunity for those people that have been invited and certain other people that will commit to staying throughout the entire process and the entire session to help the foundation determine how they actually move in the direction of establishing philanthropy around ecosystems in the ag space. Um, and then you've got from, from, from lab to farm, a session presented by our sponsors, Brian Cave. And by the way, so far as our sponsors are concerned, a, a, a round of applause for all of them for supporting what is the best show, showcase of its kind in the world. So, um, Finally, just this one thing that I want to show, share with you that this year we bring it all back again, starting with inputs through post-harvest processing and then taking into account consumer trends and consumer tastes that are changing, full value back to recycling waste back into inputs again. So we've come full circle in a sense on both the determination of content that we've actually been talking about over the last eight years, but also in the kind of solutions we've brought to bear as a showcase. So just a very quick thing. This slide, by the way, will be up on the, uh, on the showcase uh, site uh, right after the uh, session today. Um, here are the partners and uh, uh, sponsors, partners, and company mentors, again, that Sam and I talked about last year, too many to, to call out individually. 
but obviously they're in your book, so thank you again. And now, you were all here yesterday for the audience uh, voting and people's choice vote. Uh, remember, you need to text Ag Showcase to 22333. If you haven't already done so, you can try that now. Uh, and you can vote after each block of company presentations. Uh, obviously, I recognize that this is highly unscientific and also is likely to be biased in favor of the most good-looking or impressive or you know, uh, dramatic showman. But in fact, it's a, it's a good way to recognize that your taste is terrible. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to announce again is the debut of Lada's Ideas Energized Prize of $10,000 to the best company. We've got a set of judges and a set of criteria. The winners will be announced at lunch on Wednesday, and those companies that are, have been selected and are not at the lunch on Wednesday will not get the prize. So, therefore, this is your incentive to stay on to the bitter end. Uh, also, social media. Here is the hashtag, hashtag 16AIS, 16AIS, at Ag Showcase, is the handle, and of course the Lauder Link meeting scheduler, which you have all been using over the last couple of days. Uh, so, with that, let me start then with calling up my colleague, Claire, uh, and we can just sort of introduce the, the first session. And Claire, again, I've already led off the, the, the issue of the farm, uh, farm, uh, perspe farmer's perspective, so why don't you go ahead okay. and take over. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Somebody lost a Clayton Plaza hotel door key. See me if you, if you need that. And then the other thing is some of you may have gotten two programs because we didn't communicate well to you. There was one in your bag on the outside pocket. If you picked up a second, bring it back because some people didn't get a program. So end of housekeeping items. So we're going to have a panel with these three perspectives this morning. Our first, um, sorry, not a panel, a set of short spotlights. We're going to hold questions to the end because it's, we think each of them may have something to say about every single question. So we're going to make that interactive. Our first speaker on The View from the Farm is going to be Matt Mayer from MPG Farms. He is a multi-generational heartland uh, farming family. He farms 9,000 plus acres in northwest Iowa, Iowa, and he has a very interesting view on the future of commodities such that your cornflakes box may tell you who picked your corn. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Mayer. Um, I grew up and farm in northwest Iowa. In fact, um, I'm 30 minutes from Minnesota and about 45 minutes from South Dakota, so I'm about the last place you can be in Iowa and still be in Iowa. Um, I would like to take like the next eight to ten minutes and just tell you well, at least a little bit of my perspective, give you a real quick overview of my farm and the operation, and then just take you on a quick trip through history and where I think things are going to go. So, maybe, yeah. There we go. So MGP Farms, we are, we farm 9,000 acres of corn and soybeans, and we do this in a strip-till, no-till environment, and we collect data on almost every trip we make across the farm, and we make our management decisions and our input decisions from that, from that data that we collect. Now, here's our little trip through history, and, and I pick 1837 as a date in history because it's important to ag, because that is the year a uh, blacksmith by the name of John Deere pounded out the steel plow that changed ag and the prairie forever. Um, so John Deere makes his steel plow, and it's the first sign that farmers started going from hand tools to animal-drawn tools, which allowed us to farm more acres. Now, I also like to compare it to other industries, and aviation is kind of my, one of my favorite. Um, so in this same time period, the Wright brothers make their trip uh, that everybody read about in history books, 853 feet, and changed the world. So what else is going on in that time? Uh, we got the Industrial Revolution, but the biggest thing here is 43% of our population is involved in farming. And in that time, we go down to 27%, and our world population is estimated at 1.5 billion. So as I go into our next segment of history, John Deere's plow did a fantastic job of breaking the prairie, 
when we go into a, one of the worst droughts in the Midwest and the wind decides to blow for 10 years and we get the dirty 30, we get the Dust Bowl. Uh, but the thing I find interesting here is 1952. So it's been over 100 years since the plow, but it took till 1952 to have more tractors on the farm than horses. Now my dad grew up helping my grandfather farm with horses. So that fast, it's now starting to change. And I'd be remiss not to mention fellow Iowan Norman Borlaug, uh, who happens to also be from my wife's hometown. Um, his research during this time fed billions and continues to feed billions of people in the world. And uh, which he, as you probably read upstairs, won the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1970s for it. But the interesting thing also to me is in aviation in this time period. So 1901, Wright brothers fly, but aviation, things are just ticking along. In this short amount of time, we break the sound barrier, we begin space travel, and we develop some of the same technologies that we're using today in aviation. So in that time period, we're going through the Great Depression. The population in the world doubles, but the US population now, we're 3.7% of the population are involved in the farm. So now we're into present. <clears throat> the ag sector, um, I have to talk a little bit about the 1980s because it's a big impact on farm population. Um, the 1980s, there was a lot of fathers and sons that had conversations that went like this. So Matt, go to college, get your college education, and never return to agriculture. And that was a real conversation that was had, by the way. Um, I listened to part of that. Um, I did get my college education, but I couldn't stay out of ag. But in the last 30 years in agriculture, the technology has just been phenomenal. It's been coming to us so quickly. We now have tractors that are steering themselves, our combines steer themselves. The amount of data that we can collect to make management decisions has been unbelievable. Um, we, we use drones and satellite imagery now. And I would be willing to bet, in fact, I know and can guarantee I have more technology in my tractor and my combines today than the Apollo 11 mission had to land on the moon. So what else has happened? We are less than 2% of the population now. So we're being asked to farm more acres, more efficiently, and being more environmentally concerned of how we're doing it. Um, and of course, the world population, again, doubles. <clears throat> so there's some very obvious trends here in agriculture, correct? So obviously, the world population is on the rise. And we have to continue to figure out how we're going to feed that world population. The US population also is increasing. Um, egg consolidation increases. The technology plays a huge part of, of all of this because we can operate more efficiently. We can grow more corn on an acre than we have been able to in the past. And we also can do it in a very environmentally friendly way to reduce our carbon footprint. Now, I'll guarantee you my dad never had a conversation about carbon footprint. <laughs> Uh, and, and the other side of this is the co consumer now wants to understand what and how we're doing things. And so as I look into the future, w w conversations are going to go on and talk about soil health and how we're going to be friendly to our environment. And with the consumer being two or three generations removed from the farm, uh, we have to start educating them, not only the people in this room, but also as farmers and as an as ag industry, we have to start explaining to them how everything works. So one of the big things that I truly believe is professional farm management will become a huge part of this. And they're going to be able to connect the farmer, the land, and the end user. So as Claire mentioned, Kellogg's. My idea is, is that there'll be a QR code um, on the back of, <clears throat> of a Kellogg's box, and uh, you'll be able to scan that QR code, and it'll tell you uh, where and how that corn was raised. And, and the farm management and that professional farm management is going to be a part of that. In fact, um, about a year ago, a business partner and I started a business called BizAg Solutions. And with the belief that we are going to be able to create this, this quote unquote label, um, we want to work very close with the land owners and the land investors. And then we actually have been talking to um, a shrimp farm in Texas that is an environmentally friendly shrimp farm. And they, feed their shrimp soybean meal. So of course, the things they were talking about and the things that I'm talking about were similar. And I had a conversation with them about using our soybeans to feed their shrimp 
and now we could create a label from basically soil to plate. So the idea there again, QR code, if you go to Bubba Gump's, maybe in the corner of the menu, you can run a QR code and, and it'll bring you to a site and you'll see my smiling face in the middle of a bean field uh, explaining how we raised the bean meal that was fed to these shrimp and how those shrimp are, are going to be more environmentally friendly and in turn um, feed the world. Um, we are, we're also want to focus on the who's and uh, or how the, the product's raised, who has raised it, and we want to set a standard of, of, of high environmentally friendly stuff. Uh, the state of Iowa right now, we are um, kind of in the crosshairs. Um, Des Moines Water Works uh, has filed a lawsuit against counties in Iowa for nitrates in the water, and so we believe that in our business model that we can go out to the farmer and help change that practice through having end users uh, want our product as basically a, a brand. Uh, so with that, um, our hope is that we do change those practices. We are on the forefront and we don't have the government telling us how we're going to have to farm in the future. So there's my quick perspective and there's my contact information. Again, we're going to hold questions to the very end, so I'd like to invite Hank Gicklis from the Western Growers Association to come up. He's going to uh, give you a view of the, um, what's happening for the high-value uh, produce uh, products in the Western United States and, and a little bit about the Western Growers and how they work with their uh, members. So thank you, Claire. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I was asked to come and talk to you a little bit about our um, uh, innovation initiative, which is hubbed around um, a spot in Salinas, which is our center for uh, innovation and technology. Um, but I thought I'd start a little bit with um, uh, uh, who Western Growers is. We are a nonprofit organization. Um, we're unlike the traditional trade organization in that uh, we're extremely entrepreneurial. We don't really rely on member dues to. Uh, operate. We don't have an uh, annual trade show with a lot of, you know, vendors and events and things like that. What we have is an umbrella um, uh, organization that has a whole host of subsidiary for-profit companies underneath it that essentially underwrite all of the activities of Western growers. Um, so it's a novel, you know, trade association approach and it's, um, we're always looking for new services, new products uh, that will benefit our members and as a result that sort of led us into this um, uh, innovation initiative. Um, I head up, uh, or I shouldn't say I head up, but I am the staff member for a, a committee of our board. We have a board of um, uh, 44 um, uh, of the largest uh, fruit and vegetable companies in the United States. I probably should have said them uh, in the beginning, Western Growers represents uh, fresh fruit, nut, and vegetable growers in the states of California, Arizona, and uh, now Colorado. And collectively, our members produce over half of the total U.S. output of um, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, and that includes half of the organic um, uh, fruits and vegetables as well. Um, and we started having this conversation at the board level um, you know, kind of along the lines of what Matt was talking about um, uh, towards the end of his presentation a couple of years ago, as we engaged in policy arguments on behalf of our members um, relative to, you know, regulatory um, regimes that were being proposed by either by the federal government or the state government, one of the things that we noticed was that you know, the trade association coming forward with an anecdote really didn't um, uh, carry the day anymore. We had to have hard quantitative data to be able to influence some of the policy uh, decisions and discussions that were going on. So we started to have this conversation with our membership about how do we get this data, right? And that, um, uh, um, and will you share this information? And can we, you know, uh, aggregate information and start to talk collectively about the performance of the fruit and vegetable industry in California and Arizona. Um, 
And that led us into this, you know, sort of an examination of the different technologies and, and you know, uh, devices and, and uh, innovations that would allow for some of this, this data to be captured, if you will, um, uh, and then rolled up, you know, to somebody like a Western Growers so that we could use it. Um, we noticed that um, uh, there were a lot of individual companies within our membership who were really good at innovation and they were really good at you know, data, but they were also very siloed in what they were doing. Um, you know, they would work on perfecting some technology in their operation and um, uh, they might get some kind of uh, you know, short-lived proprietary advantage for that, but um, there's no secrets in the produce industry, so um, if they had a two-year advantage, you know, it was, it, that's what it was. I mean, people copied that technology rather quickly and readily and improved on it, and so, you know, people were investing a lot of money um, for a very short-lived sort of uh, proprietary uh, uh, advantage. And as a result, um, we had some leaders in our uh, uh, a board that started talking about wouldn't it wouldn't we as an industry be better served um, if we collaborated on these um, uh, technologies on trying to uh, find them trying to um, uh, uh, scale them commercialize them um, perfect them um, wouldn't we be better served to do that in aggregate you know for the benefit of the entire industry as opposed to you know this one-off sort of siloed um, uh, approach that, you know, the industry had been taking. And that, um, uh, in turn, um, uh, led to a request to Western Growers um, uh, from our board, you know, to try to design uh, an innovation initiative to facilitate that collaborative process. We came back to the board um, uh, of directors with a proposal, you know, uh, that really hinged around a couple of key elements, um, uh, but the bottom line goal was um, we intended to find solutions to some of the major, you know, problems that are being faced by fruit and vegetable growers in the West um, and help them, you know, uh, become more widely commercially available more rapidly. Um, the, the process that we use is obviously, you know, Western growers, we're a 91-year-old uh, trade association, we have very uh, high level of trust and a high level of contact with our members. So we work, you know, very um, uh, diligently to try to understand what their issues and what their problems are. Um, and we feel like we have a very good handle on that, but, you know, we, we spend a lot of time and energy also talking to them about, you know, what exactly is the issue that, you know, is the pain point on your, in your farm, on your operation, et cetera. So it starts with understanding what the problem is. Um, and when we understand what the problem is, then we can go out and we can actually look for technologies um, or entrepreneurs or innovators or bright minds, you know, that are working on something or capable of working on something that addresses, you know, the particular problem that we're interested in. When we find them, I think the, the, the key to what we're doing is, you know, a lot of times um, uh, these uh, entrepreneurs and innovators are not working in concert with the industry. Um, one of the complaints that we had for years and years and years was there were a plethora of um, uh, you know, innovators and solutions that were coming to agriculture um, trying to present their offering, if you will, and our guys would come to us and say, you know, they're bringing them, us solutions for problems that we di didn't know we had, you know. I mean, there was no connection, if you will, between the entrepreneur and um, uh, the ag space. So that's what we do is we, we work hard to connect them um, uh, with our membership. And the, the folks who are working on these solutions now are doing it in concert with growers so that, you know, uh, they get real-world feedback, they do pilots, they get... Um, uh, um, they, they build it out in a way that makes it uh, of high utility and usefulness to the, to the grower or the processor or whoever it is that, you know, where they happen to be working. Um, if we do those three steps well, then we've always felt like we could stand that process up in front of the investment community and say, here's something that addresses a real problem on the farm. It um, uh, is... Uh, 
developed in concert with the industry, so with the customers, if you will, the end users, um, and we think it's ripe for commercialization. I don't, okay, did I go too far? Um, so, the Western Growers Center for Innovation and Technology, as, as I said, is where we're trying to hub all this stuff through. Um, uh, we have sponsors. Sponsors get line of sight to the technology companies that are in there. They get to provide some direction for the center. Uh, we have startups. Obviously, one of the strongest values is that we connect them to the industry. Um, but we spend a lot of time educating the, the, our community on what the startups are doing and those types of things. There's a whole host of events, and it's a staffed um, uh, operation for us. Uh, although I will say it's, we're not in it to make a, a profit. We're a nonprofit trade association. This is a nonprofit venture. Um, the opportunities and obstacles, um, uh, well, we're located in Salinas. Um, uh, so we're proximate to uh, the, the Bay Area and those entrepreneurs. Um, but we're in the heart of the ag sector, right, which makes it easy for us uh, to connect folks. And people are coming and using our facility to, as a, a, a base of operations, if you will, to try to penetrate the specialty crop sector. Um, we have a strong Western Growers band like, brand, like I said, 91-year-old trade association that is widely regarded across the country. Um, and because of that, we have deep and wide relationships with a whole host of other trade groups, particularly in the specialty crop sector. Um, the things that we're still working to try to build into this center, which, by the way, has only been open since uh, December, um, our financial support for the startups, we're not providing that. Um, and we are just bringing on some physical um, uh, you know, land that we can do some demonstration and R&D and those types of things. What we have is an office facility right now. Um, we're starting to do focus growth or target, target our problems. You know, it's grown organically to date. Um, uh, we're also working to build out our, um, uh, uh, our ecosystem. We're setting up uh, reciprocal uh, uh, agreements and arrangements with other incubators. Um, and again, like I said, we're working on uh, uh, trying to put a financial support package in place with this as well. And that's our Center for Innovation. That's why we're doing it, and you can find out more um, uh, at that uh, website there, westerngrowersinnovation.com. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. And for our third in this series of View from the Farms, we have Darren Keeler, uh, uh, as an entrepreneur himself and uh, leader of uh, AutoGrow, an entrepreneurial company in the indoor ag space from New Zealand, but also quite active in the US. And he's going to give us his view of where we stand with indoor ag. Right. Thank you, Claire. Morning, everybody. Uh, so um, indoor ag has arrived. Uh, it's a very exciting industry to be in. Uh, I'm not a farmer. Sorry, Rohit, wherever you are. Um, you don't want me anywhere near a farm. Um, I'm a technology guy. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of technology now being used in, in the farming industry, as we've heard the speakers talking about just before me. Um, there's so much going on in Dorag, and I'm going to have to sort of race through it in the next 10 minutes uh, to try and give you a flavor for it. Uh, we work across 24 different countries, uh, ranging from the Americas all the way through to the Middle East. Uh, so I'll cite some examples of what's going on in there. Uh, we are in what I'm terming the second wave. The first wave of indoor ag was really propagated through greenhouse uh, technology uh, that sort of came into uh, flavor in the 60s and has sort of been iterating ever since over the last 50 years or so. Now what we're seeing is a whole raft of new technologies that have come in <coughs> that essentially enable uh, us to be able to grow uh, food anywhere uh, that you can create a controlled environment. So that really changes the game. And so we're seeing an explosion in investments and a lot of new entrants coming into the market, a lot of new people coming in uh, to be growers. Uh, so what is indoor ag? Well, how we define that is essentially everything ranging from protected cropping, uh, which is typically hoop houses, uh, all the way through to very high-tech uh, controlled environment agriculture, which is where you have virtual clean room environments 
uh, which are pest and pathogen free. So it really does range across a very wide uh, spectrum. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Mexico. Um, Mexico has gone through a lot of uh, evolution in the way that it's applied protected cropping and greenhouse technology in the last 15 years. Um, at this point, according to the USDA figures, they've got about 15,000 hectares of protected cropping uh, space. About 10,000 of that is in greenhouses. Uh, they're now the first ranked net exporter of tomatoes, with most of that export of tomatoes coming to the US market. Um, one of the major changes is that with tomatoes and uh, in particular, uh, they've shifted from soil to indoor, and to the point now where about 50% of their tomato production is done in an indoor environment, and that's been increasing over that last 15 year uh, period, and that, that sort of gives you an indication of what's going on uh, around the globe as well. What type of problems are customers seeking to address? Well, it depends on where they are. So we work with uh, the Egyptian government. Uh, their driver is geopolitical. What they're worried about is food security. Uh, they rely a lot on importation of fresh produce. What they're trying to do is establish uh, farming practices so that they can uh, be self-sufficient in food production. You know, that's a, that's a security issue for them. Uh, it then goes into things that we're much more familiar with. You know, we've got the impact of climate change. We've got the um, cost of land going up. Uh, I was reading recently about Colombian uh, cut flower market. I mean, you know, you wouldn't think you'd have a problem with the rising price of land in Colombia. But they've got uh, land prices going up. They've got labor costs going up. Uh, they're now having to look at how they can innovate and bring more automation and technology into what they're doing in order to remain competitive. Uh, almost their entire market is, is the U.S. Again, they, they export cut flowers to the U.S. market. Uh, what are some of the advantages? You'll be familiar with a lot of these, but clearly if you can control the climate, it offers a lot of advantages. If you can control the environment within which the crops are propagating, uh, that brings you um, a lot of uh, potential in terms of what you can do. Uh, pests and pathogens, again, it, it, it ranges from uh, still very much affected by the outside environment uh, all the way through to having a structure where you can pretty much uh, eliminate pests and pathogens out of that environment, but it involves more capital cost up front in order to create that environment to achieve that. Uh, water, um, you can grow high water weight crops um, and use about 90% less water than you would in an open field. So there's some very clear advantages when you're growing greens, when you're growing uh, tomatoes, berries, Anything that's a high water weight crop, uh, you know, you have significant economic advantages growing uh, indoors. Uh, and then financially, if you're growing at scale, uh, it becomes a very profitable uh, enterprise. Uh, disruption. I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, that. And really what we're talking about is digital disruption. So digital disruption is hitting almost every major uh, industry at the moment. Uh, it comes through in terms like the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything or big data, um, but that's a real thing. And so there's a lot going on in this space. It has not hit indoor ag yet, but it's coming. So what we're seeing at the moment is a lot of innovation in things like LED lighting systems, HVAC systems, but we're not seeing true disruption yet, but that is going to arrive. And the form it's gonna come in is in data. Um, you've heard from some of the presenters yesterday that there's a lot happening in uh, sensor development. Data comes from sensors, so essentially as the sensors get smarter, they get more accurate, they become cheaper, it means that they can proliferate. And then when we have more data, we get better information. So the evolution of this is firstly around decision support. One of the challenges in all forms of agricultural production is that uh, there's a lack of people who actually understand how to grow food, right? So this is, a, this is a thing we're seeing, particularly with new entrants coming in. They're highly educated people generally speaking, but they don't necessarily know how to grow crops and they don't know how to run a, a business. Um, and so if you can automate some of those uh, things for them uh, through a knowledge base, then it becomes much easier for them to simply push a button and say, today I'm growing basil, tomorrow I'm gonna grow you know, tomatoes, and they don't have to understand all the processes involved, the recipes involved in growing those crops because you've already automated that uh, knowledge base for them. And that's where uh, the technology is going. This is a quote from Dr. Nate Stories, based in Laramie, Wyoming. He founded a company called Bright Agrotech, which is in the urban and vertical space. Uh, he said, there's nothing we cannot grow indoors. The question is not what, 
can we grow? The real question is what should we grow? So essentially what Nate's saying is that conceptually there's actually nothing you cannot grow indoors with the technology that we have, including you know, cereals and row crop uh, type um, products, but does that mean you do it? No. I mean, essentially it's not economically viable, uh, and his litmus test is, is fundamentally if it takes a combine harvester to harvest it, then it's probably not suitable for indoor ag. Um, you know, what can you grow? It goes back to those high water weight crops again. Um, it's a more sustainable practice to grow it indoors because you're consuming less water. We can recirculate water. Um, we can recirculate nutrients. So there's a lot more efficiency in what we can do uh, with indoor production. Um, I want to talk a little bit about urban growing because this is sort of what is pro you know, propelling a lot of the more recent advances. Um, I think there's a tendency to think of this as a fad and a very hyped up thing. Um, I don't feel that way about it. I think that fundamentally it's a response to increasing urban density. Um, you know, we talk about the fact we're going to have 10 billion people in the world uh, by 2050. Well, 70% of those people are going to be urbanized. So we're seeing a, you know, a move towards massive concentration of population. Uh, that's going to take effect not just in the US, but in Mumbai, um, Cairo, uh, any of the major cities, you know, we're, we're seeing an increasing movement. Um, and that means we need to shorten the value chain. We've got to be able to produce food closer to where it's going to be consumed. It's going to be very important. Um, vertical growing, just that distinction, because there is a bit of confusion with these terms. Vertical growing comes through in two main ways. One is around building-based ecosystems. Uh, so this is getting right out there now about where we might go with um, urban design. And it's the idea to basically create environments that not only serve the human beings inside them, but also allow for um, crop propagation within those environments to capitalize on things like CO2 and O2 exchange, um, how we manage heat and energy. Um, and basically, you know, take what's been created inside a building and use that to actually grow produce. So there's a crossover to indoor, uh, sorry, within urban ag, um, but it's really around taking an ecosystem approach with um, urban design. Um, the other flavor of vertical growing is really around high density crop systems. So if you have a look in this photograph, this is one of Nate's systems, uh, the zip farm. Um, and really one of the keys with urban ag efficiency is around density of crop production. So you've got to try and get as much stuff growing in as small a space as you can. And essentially in a shipping container, you can grow as much lettuce as you could grow in a whole football field of soil. So that's the sort of um, parallel that you've got to uh, look at. Uh, just from our friends at Ag Investor, uh, sorry, Ag Funder, um, we've, in 2015, there's about $4.6 billion invested in ag tech. Uh, only around 77 million of that went into indoor ag. So there's a real big opportunity for more investment to go that way. Uh, there was about uh, around half a billion invested in precision agriculture, and there's a lot of crossover um, in, in that space. Uh, just quickly on the, uh, where things are going beyond organic, what that simply means is that if you want to talk about food security and you want to talk about traceability, uh, you know, indoor ag offers up a lot of advantages in that space as well. So it is around, uh, and also the quality of the produce, because you're, pr you're predominantly growing hydroponically. So basically it's a very low risk way of also producing uh, food. Uh, beyond the salad eaters basically refers to the fact that, that at the moment there's over 60 crops that we can basically grow economically uh, within indoor agricultural environments, uh, and that's going to keep increasing. So the fact is people shouldn't just see it as an option for growing foods they typically associate with salads. Um, in Egypt, for example, they're growing chickpeas, which is used in hummus production. It's a really big crop over there. So the moon, Mars, and back is really looking at what the International Space Station, NASA, all these guys are doing with how they can grow produce uh, for astronauts in flight, but there's a lot that they achieve in that uh, R&D development that we can pull back into mainstream agricultural production. So what I'm talking about is everything they push to the edge, we eventually can port back in uh, to the mainstream industry. And so it's always good to be looking at what these guys are innovating on. So in summary, Indorag is not a small sector. It's a large sector, it's diverse, it's sophisticated, and it's growing very fast. Uh, the fact is we're going to have 70% urbanization by 2050, so this whole move towards um, urban-based growing and local and community growing is only going to get stronger and stronger. It's not a fad. Uh, advancing 
technology is going to be disrupting, especially where it comes to digital. Uh, so we'll see more coming in that space, and that's where investment needs to go. And generally, I'd just encourage you to evaluate the economics around indoor ag. And even if you're an outdoor ag, um, think about diversification into indoor ag. You know, if you're operating a large farming operation, and as some farmers have done that we've spoken to at this event, then consider diversification into indoor ag. Make it part of your, your mix in terms of your business profile. Um, and even start thinking about what's happening in urban production. So even if you're based in Iowa, you know, have a look at what's going on in Boston, New York, Chicago, and see if you shouldn't be looking at what you might be doing in that space. Because what you bring is an understanding around crops, and you, want, and you bring an understanding around the business of, of, of food. And that's a really valuable thing because it's something that's missing with a lot of the new entrant people that are coming in. And that's me. Thank you very much. So if I could, I would like to invite Matt and Hank to come back on the stage with Darren, and we'll entertain questions. Questions? Charlie. I would like to have any of you comment on the role of rural America where most farmers are small. I mean, there are, most food comes from the big farms, but most farms are small. And so what is the role of the small farmer as you see it in rural America? Yes, Charlie was asking about the, the, the view of our speakers on rural uh, U.S. Uh, economic financial health in, in terms of where the technology and the farms are going. Well, um, I know in our part of the world, in, in rural America, there's, there's a lot of farmers that are that 500 to 1,000 acres. Um, some of those uh, will survive to the next generation. Some of them will not. It's just, um, it's about gaining the efficiencies. It's like running any business. Um, so it's gonna have a huge impact. Uh, as I look through my area where I grew up, um, the town I grew up by was 1,400 people, which is not very big, but I go through that town today, um, it's maybe 100. So it's changing quickly. Darren, do you wanna say anything? It's sort of that move to urbanization? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, a lot of our customers are small to medium growers, so um, most of them are family operations and small holders. Uh, I really think for our customer base, the key is around, uh, you know, keeping up with technology and looking at how they can um, uh, become more efficient and more productive uh, through automation. And, you know, that, that tends to keep them economically viable. And so really, if you're a small operator, you've got to be a very smart operator. And if you're not, then you will wink out of existence. Hank, how about in the West with, with your association and yeah. your members? So uh, the small farm is vital. Um, uh, I, I, I see them playing roles in a couple of different ways. I mean, one is they are uh, suppliers you know, to a lot of the shippers, processors, et cetera. So even if you're in a 50-acre environment, you, know, you can be growing something that you know, essentially is... Uh, you know, a vital part of somebody else's supply. And then there's a whole host of folks who are doing niche, you know, um, uh, marketing and things like that in the West, you know, from these small farms. They're either growing a niche commodity um, uh, where 50 acres, you know, of that particular commodity is like the world supply, cilantro or something like that. Um, uh, or they're, um, uh, um, you know, they're doing a direct farm to like restaurant or farm to farmer's market or those types of things as well. And they're, you know, um, uh, like I said, they're a vital component part of the, you know, the, the Western ag system for sure, it's particularly in specialty crops. So it sounds like business model is, is going to matter, Charlie, for that, for that health to continue. Other questions? So for a, 
Yeah. So, so we were, we were you were asking about nutrient concerns about nutrient loss and how that would be be impactful. Okay. And you wanted Matt to answer first and then move on. Yeah. So the biggest thing for us is nitrogen management. Um, so what we have done on our farm is about eight years ago we started to go to a no-till system, uh, which then preserves the soil because we get the two-inch rain um, if it's tilled soil, most of that soil ends up either in a ditch or in a river, and of course nutrients are tied to that. So we went to a no-till system. Um, what we also do is we started to split apply nitrogen. So we, we apply nitrogen four times, three or four times through the year, where in the past it always had been done once, either in the fall or the spring and you were done. Um, and so what we've been able to do is actually cut our nitrogen rates back and we are growing a bigger crop. Um, and the third part of that is, is cover crops are becoming a bigger player for us. That, that will help uh, hold everything in place and uh, hold that nitrogen in place. So um, uh, how it's affecting you know, Western agriculture, I will tell you right now, one of the biggest impacts is the regulatory burden that's being placed on um, uh, uh, particularly coastal California, Central Valley California in terms of uh, nitrate discharge, right? I mean, the, the, there, has, there have been legacy issues associated with the, uh, the overuse of fertilizers in the past and fertilizers coming from other sources as well, even though ag gets to blame for this. So we're fundamentally focused on, you know, what can we do to, number one, be more precise with nitrogen application now and essentially, you know, only apply what the plant needs at the time that it needs it, et cetera. And there's a whole host of technologies that go into that. But we're also faced with all these legacy issues, you know, like how to go in and clean up groundwaters and surface waters where there are um, uh, uh, exceedances of nitrate you know, MCLs and those types of things. So we're looking for technologies that can help with that, you know, sort of cleanup um, uh, um, of existing si situations as well. So, so past, present, and future. Yeah, and the government is actually telling us now, you know, you, it, through different kinds of signals, right? I mean, taxes on fertilizers, et cetera, you know, this is how you're gonna apply <coughs> nitrogen. And I think that's been one of our focal points is we wanna keep the government out of, you know, the prescribing how to farm. Brad. To kind of dovetail into what was just described, you know, uh, around the nutrient management and I would say even broader, you know, soil health and improvement and management, um, what kind of innovations from the farmer perspective do you think are really going to be required to have it really move the needle across the entire community instead of just, you know, the more advanced farmers that are already doing like no till or low till? Um, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, from my perspective, um, you know, a farmer won't change his behavior unless he's going to get paid for it. I mean, it's, it becomes a bottom line issue. So, um, so one of the things that we are trying to do with, with our Viz Ag solutions is to create a market that is going to require them to do it and hopefully gain a premium out of the, the grain they raise in that manner. And uh, that way they'll, they'll be paid to basically change a behavior, right? Um, and it's better for the environment. <clears throat> and so that's a real quick overview of one of the things we're trying to do there. I, well, I agree. I, I mean, I think if a, a grower, a farmer has to see ROI, the ROI doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, revenue back to the farm. It could be essentially avoidance of some kind of, you know, regulatory uh, uh, over, o oversight, you know, or things like that as well. And I think that's one of the roles that, you know, a trade association plays, right? Um, uh, we find technologies um, uh, that, uh, you know, look like they're um, a, a good uh, fit, if you will, to address a regulatory issue. Uh, they have some ROI, you know, to the grower, either through, you know, improved efficiencies or avoidance of regulation, et cetera. And then we work very hard to extend that, you know, to our entire community of growers. Um, uh, and it's slow. I mean, people are tough to change, um, uh, slow to change. Um, uh, the, the big companies are usually the early adopters, but, 
You know, over time, you continue to beat that drum, you see it sort of spread. Other questions? That is part of the challenge of it at the moment because it's in that very early stage of innovation. It, it is a lot of the systems that have been developed are proprietary in nature, which is a problem. Um, so what we're trying to promote is an open standards approach to systems integration um, because that will help the technology proliferate a lot easier. Um, so it's a lot of the dialogue that's going on at the moment within the industry sector is around pushing them towards open standards and interoperability and making sure that whatever they create is easily easily replicable. Um, because at the moment, a lot of them are not. Um, I think that there's also going to be a lot of uh, consolidation in, in, in the sector. There's a lot of uh, shipping container uh, startups, for example. I mean, not all of those are going to survive. Um, but the best ones will, you know. Um, I think there's a lot that's going on with the rooftop development systems, you know, that is, is capable of carrying over to other places, but they've got to make it easy to create, you know, repeatable turnkey systems rather than, you know, what essentially giant lab systems. Um, so you're quite right. That's where we are right now. But those things will keep evolving uh, over the coming decade or so. Yeah. Josh, you had a question. Well, um, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on water rights. I mean, we have somebody else in Western Growers who, who really fundamentally focuses on water rights. But I mean, water is a critical issue for us. I mean, I would say in our top two issues, you know, that we're looking for technology and water is one of them, labor is the other one. Um, uh, and it's not just quantity, it's also quality. But, you know, in the quantity space, one of the, um, uh, one of the things that's uh, fundamental in California is, you know, we, um, uh, you know, we, we have to be a lot more precise with water because, you know, we're in a fierce competition for a limited resource that is becoming more limited. Um, uh, and we're in competition with uh, the, the environmental uses for water and with the urban uses and industrial uses for water. And we're 2% of the population, so we're typically on the losing end of that battle, which means we have to drive efficiency into that you know, equations. So we're looking for things that will allow us to be a lot more precise. Um, uh, and we're looking at the technologies that we're existing, use, existing that we currently use and how do we improve them too. In terms of key technologies, obviously there's infield sensors and things like that, but I mean, uh, we're also looking at uh, satellite um, uh, 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 technology and sensor technology in the field that allows us to know the entire crop uh, water budget for a farm. Um, uh, so that we can um, uh, uh, model different um, uh, uh, conservation practices, if you will, and we can determine what the conserved fraction would be, and that makes that conserved fraction available, you know, for other uses or for additional uses, et cetera. Okay. So there's a whole host of things I could. I, I'm going to interrupt too much time. and and nope, no, I'm going to ask the audience to join me in thanking these speakers, and I know you have lots of questions. Please come talk to our speakers.